With spring around the corner, it's a good time to stock up on C60 Evo's breakthrough longevity and well-being products. Treat yourself, your skin, mental focus, and deeper sleep to C60 Evo organic edible oils, skin serums, and hair renewal. Using Nobel Prize winning science, their lab manufactures and delivers Pure C60 ESS60, the cleanest and most potent C60 products you'll find anywhere. Healthy food, clean water, exercise, and C60 Evo are your best defense for radiant health and longevity. Old dogs can learn new tricks and cats love it too. Everyone benefits from C60 Evo. Enjoy 15 to 20% off on monthly subscriptions and collection sets. Use our personal code Inspired Channel for 10% off at checkout. You know, Christine and I have tried these products ourselves and we personally recommend them. Feeling is believing and they've got you covered. Hey, hey, Inspired Tribe, my fellow freedom lovers, it's John Nolan here. Thank you so much for tuning in for another Inspired Conversation. And today, I believe for the 18th time, it's your favorite guest, our favorite guest, Frank Jacob. Thank you so much for joining us again today. You don't need any further introduction, my friend. How are you doing, John? It feels like it's been an eternity, but it's only been uh, about, what, six <laughs> weeks since we last talked? <laughs> well, Frank, we're going to figure out how long it's really been today. Uh, you know, <laughs> thinking about eternity and all that. Um Frank, we're going to talk into uh, uh, dive into a subject today that um, might explain a lot of inexplicable things, and that is time travel. And of course, through the looking glass conversations that we've had, we've touched on this subject many times. But we're going to go really deep today. But before we do that, Frank, uh, you messaged me a couple of days ago and said, "Here are some things going on that you might feel, but here's the data. We have some hard data to share today that is very timely." What's going on with our planet and why are people feeling so intensely right now? Well, it's very interesting because it's like uh, the we're entering a new uh, solar cycle. And as a result of that uh, solar cycle, we're, uh, some very unusual things are starting to take place that are a little bit unprecedented. So when I, when I pinged you last, uh, whenever it was a couple of days ago, I was just in the middle of doing uh, prep for a show that I was that I recorded with uh, our German biophysicist friend over here, Dieter Brewers, because he does a sort of an annual reality check show. And he was freaking out because he's been watching the sun, of course, for 30 years. And what happened um, in the last few days is just, you know, hard to explain. You know, it's like I'll give you an example of what took place. You know, I have it all listed. And this is only some of it, actually. Basically, all the uh, measuring stations for the Schumann frequencies, they all dropped out globally. They just hit a peak. Dropped out, they, they quit working. They quit working. It's like they, they were blown out. You, and right before they blew out, there was a massive amplitude uh, you know, in the signals that, was so, that overrode, I guess, what their calibration is able to deal with. So they, all of them fell out. Um, then the magnetometer uh, that HeartMath um, runs, that register that measures the magnetosphere of the Earth, that fell out as well. Um, and there was a solar storm. I guess you could say this must have been tied together because all these things were happening simultaneously. There was a solar storm that hit us, and the winds reached um, a speed of 3 million kilometers per hour, if you can imagine that, right? It's like it just and and there's a scale for it um you know we can look at a couple of these data you know and uh, that shows you that it just reaches it over the the peak level of recording and drops out completely it disappears and it shows up again later again but and there's this period of time where it's gone and you know i think i don't know if you noticed it and where you are but in ohio for example or in ireland uh, or in in germany in like western germany they had aurora borealis and no, I, I, we didn't see that. No, we didn't see that here. No. Well, this has been going on in places that you normally never get Aurora Borealis. I'm talking, you know, like this, this level of latitude is, is just, it doesn't happen. Right. But it only happens when the ionosphere is supercharged. Of course, then it does happen. And that happens super rarely. Right. So you couple that together with um, other stuff that we've talked about before, like the magnetosphere of the earth is weakening. You know, and so you have, we're moving into a period of a new solar cycle. The Earth's magnetic as magnetosphere is weakening. And we're entering a zone in the galaxy where we're in direct line of fire with, um, you know, particles and waves that we normally don't get hit by. So the fact that 
we're in that zone and that our magnetosphere is weakened means we're getting more of that. We're feeling more of that. So it's no surprise that people have been getting like headaches and, and, you know, some people, you know, feel heart murmurs and, you know, heart tremors and stuff. And some people get tired and they just can't get up. In my case, I had a bit of that too. Like I was really feeling like, you know, I don't know what it was. I don't normally get sick or rarely, you know, and I just felt like low energy and, I felt mentally in a weird state. I don't know how you felt, but man, I felt like I had times where I was going like, ah, maybe I should just quit. You know, this is why bother, you know, this is that there's all these other great people out there. They don't, nobody needs us anyway. Right. You know, so I was like, all this stuff was going on in my head. I'm like, wait a minute, where's that coming from? Right. Meanwhile, the sun is entering a pole flip. So right now in its phase of when it enters this new cycle, it's, it's not just like, usually it just flips. What's happening right now, there's something called a quadrupole, a very rare phenomenon when the sun hasn't quite flipped and there's four poles, two north poles and two south poles. And when that happens, the sun just flips out and sends all kinds of energy from it, right? So we've got all this stuff going on, all this energy is coming at us. Um, meanwhile, remember we talked about this pole moving, the magnetic north pole moving back a few shows ago? And we were saying, look, what does that I mean? Certainly do. And that, you know, in March, come March or April, we're looking at, you know, if it continues along that path, it's going to reach this 40 degree mark, right? Well, guess what? We've reached the 40 degree mark, John. <laughs> so it's anyone's guess what will happen now, right? So, and then to cap it all off nicely, CERN decided to restart their experiments between the 6th and the 9th of March, of course, right at that time, because there's been a few geophysicists that are talking about the peak time of when this massive flux of energy is going to hit us is going to hit between on March 7th or plus or minus three days, right? So what are we now? We're March 8th, right? So we're kind of right in the sweet spot. So all of this stuff could still kind of go out of control. There could be earthquakes, which is, you know, the last time, uh, you know, you can use the Schumann frequencies measurement as a way to gauge um, potential earthquake activity. And if we had these uh, Schumann frequency measuring stations in more places around the world, they're like an early warning system. Because what happens is that one particular frequency, like the main band of the Schumann frequencies is 8 hertz. It has to do with the circumference of the Earth. But there's also subharmonics, like there's 14 hertz, 20 hertz, 33 hertz, 39 hertz, etc. But this one band, like the, they're called the second and third modes, right? The second and third modes, when they start going higher than the primary mode, which is eight hertz, there's usually some kind of a, you know, an earthquake. And the Turkey earthquake that happened at the beginning of the month coincides perfectly with that model. So what happens right now, and exactly right now, we're actually in that period where we could be having some major earthquake, which is the main reason I told you about it, not to freak you out. But just to say, hey, look, you know, do you have uh, stuff on hand? Are you prayer prepared for, say, there really was, like, it could be a shortage, a power outage. It could be an earthquake. It could be any, no, any number of things. We don't really know. Nobody can really predict it. But earthquakes are definitely one of the prime factors, right? But uh, here, look at this. I mean, this is, this is an example. Like, here, you know... <laughs> This energy level is what we were talking about. And all these white zones, right? They're just like, it's not something that you normally get, right? The, the normal is here. Like you see the normal on the right side of the screen, the winter normal of the Schumann frequencies is this zone here, this darker zone. And the one to the far right is in the summer when there's more growth of plants, there's more activity, the magnetic uh, activity, the Schumann frequencies gain in, in strength. But what's happening right now is on the left side, and we're seeing it at the top of the screen. You're seeing this is what's going on right now. And this is totally, like, unprecedented, right? You know, so, you know, and you can see all these, like, diagrams of how the Schumann frequency is right there. You know, they just, they cacked, they cacked out completely. Here also, you know, you can see the frequencies spiking. And then at the far right, you see they just basically drop off. So, you know, essentially what you've got going on here is you've got, Here's that diagram of how we're being hit, like with solar winds, which are hitting our magnetosphere. Oh, yeah. And the final factor was that the full moon. <laughs> We've oh, yeah. got a full moon coming, right? And what happens when there's a moon entering our magnetosphere is that the way the moon works is that the moon is um, highly um, charged as well because it isn't getting 
uh, it doesn't have its own magnetosphere, so it picks up um, negative and positive charges. And on one side, it's positively charged, and on the other side, the dark side, it's negatively charged. So what that causes is when these pla huge plasma waves coming off the sun, when they move, they usually get shielded by our magnetosphere and they get deflected. But when the sun just happens to move into the magnetosphere of the Earth, what it does is it pulls that plasma back into its orbit and then shoots it out the other side and ricochets it back at the Earth. So that's going on as well, right? So you know, here's a few pictures of the of the of the ionosphere, you know, and it's just um, it's it's really wild, you know, because uh, and then here you've got this finally this sunspot activity that's coming at us. This is a, a diagram of a sun, a massive sunspot that is going direct between the seventh and the ninth. So right now, this sunspot is facing us, and whenever sunspots like this face us, the the increase of potential for these things to flare out and shoot stuff because this is where the flares emerge from, right? Is very, very high. So it's highly likely that something major could go down. It's highly likely. It doesn't mean it's 100%. And it certainly isn't panic material. It's just about being prepared for it. And it's about being aware that your consciousness might be, or your, your mind or your feelings. Like with me, I just explained some of them earlier, what I was going through. I think these are all related because we are directly our brains are tied into the Schumann frequencies. We resonate at eight hertz in our brains, just like the Schumann frequencies. So we're very much connected to the to Mother Earth Gaia, and and so you know I think we can all expect we should all be on guard and vigilant for some weird, chaotic stuff that could happen in the, in the coming days. You know, and Frank, you say this as if weird and chaotic stuff hasn't been happening. For well, yeah, I mean, you're seeing it, right? You're, you're seeing it happening, right? So, I mean, look at this. Look at this sketch here. This is out of one of our films. This shows you that whenever our solar activity goes wonky and bonkers, civilizations rise and fall. So, like, we are moving into gain again to a period of really bizarre, anomalous, in intense, high activity. So that could have consequences for our entire civilization. So weird things could be going on like you know like like look at this bank like the the swiss credit swiss bank uh, stocks are cratering i mean they they just had a 100 billion dollar bank run if you can imagine that right i mean like 100 billion dollars was was withdrawn out of their bank accounts which makes a bank go of course into a bank run which makes it panic and after cuz they never have that much money on hand as we know they're all corrupt they just take the money and stash it somewhere but when all the clients run in the door and start pulling out money They've got huge problems. So I've got friends telling me that they can't withdraw in any more than a thousand euros from their bank accounts in Greece, Italy, and Switzerland. It's, it's happening like all over the place. So these are all signs that th this has to be reflected in the chaos that's going around on the planet. So yeah, I'm going to let you take the word here for a minute. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, to me, it's um, when you're when you're in a situation, we're never objective observers because we're in it. We're in a world, we're experiencing it. When you're in a situation, you you lose the ability to, to gauge and, and really see what's happening unless you have an ability to step out, go into the bird's eye view and say, okay, wow, there's so much happening right now. It's very intense. And I think we've kind of lost the ability because it's been so intense. When you look at the news cycles, when you look at the Everything that's coming out now, it is at a, such an accelerated rate compared to five, six, seven years ago, even three years ago. Um, and and we need to connect the dots here and really see it all coincides. And there's really no stepping out of it. It's not solely human ego behavior. It's very much influenced by what is happening in the greater sphere of things. So I think it's very important. And Frank, I want to uh, later on in the show, I want to talk a little bit about what this really um, inspires in our human consciousness and what transpires through these amazing influences. Right, right. Um, it's not all bad news. It's not all bad news. We should definitely talk about that. Not at all. I think um, I think we could even uh, try to lose the good and the bad for a moment and just look at what, what it spikes within us and how we use it oftentimes, of course, depends on what our intentions are. Um, but connected to the subject in many ways, because it's all connected, but this really deeply connects also to this subject is um, the the idea of time travel. And one thing that is perhaps right off the bat for me, uh, this this conversation is not so much about establishing whether time travel could be real or not. We actually, I'm I'm certain it is real. Um, what we're going to dive into is real life time travelers. 
firsthand accounts, potential yeah. technologies, and um, what has, could, or is being done in time manipulation or history manipulation to manipulate the present. So uh, take it away, my friend. Where, we, we, where do we start on this subject? Yeah, this is a great topic. I, and when I saw you did something uh, a few, uh, couple, maybe a couple of weeks ago, you were talking about a guy called Andrew Bushago. Yes. And uh, when I saw that, I'm like, wow, that's cool that, that, that John's discovering Andrew Bushago. Because, you know, we had Andrew Bushago as one of the featured people in, our, in the film that we produced called Packing for Mars. And so I thought maybe, you know, what I did is I dug up a few of the scenes with Andrew in them. And I thought maybe, you know, it'd be cool to hear Andrew talking because, you know, the next best thing to having him on the show, which is difficult now because he's become um, technically blind and he's doing very, very little shows at this point. So, you know, when I interviewed him, I, it was still kind of at the peak of, uh, of his experience and of his disclosure of what he was going through. So I thought maybe we would, we would like to hear a couple of um, sequences that describe that of him describing what, what he experienced. And we can talk about that. I'd love Good. that. And, and I don't know if it's going to be prefaced in the videos, but uh, he's an attorney, Seattle based attorney who came he'll out. Many years ago. He'll tell us that. Let him introduce great, himself. Great, great. I'm going to play this clip and he'll make it all clear to us. Okay, here we go. Hopefully we'll hear it. I'm Andrew DiBasciago. I'm a lawyer in private practice in Washington State. I hold five academic degrees, including a Bachelor's of History from UCLA and a Master of Philosophy from the University of Cambridge. Ten years ago, I began investigating my experiences in DARPA's Project Pegasus in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Uh, I was a child participant in the early days of time-space exploration by the U.S. government. Project Pegasus was the real Philadelphia experiment. It was the U.S. time-space program at the time of its emergence. We were working with two technologies primarily uh, to access past and future events. The first was a teleporter that was being developed from papers that Nikola Tesla had left at the time of his death in 1943. We were regularly jumping through a device at the old Curtis Wright Aeronautical Company facility in Woodridge, New Jersey, and popping back into view on the grounds of the state capitol complex in Santa Fe, New Mexico. The experience of teleporting was almost emotionally overwhelming for a small child. Um, we had jumped into a vortal tunnel that had been opened up in the fabric of time space. As Jack Pruitt, one of the team leaders in Project Pegasus, once described it, that the teleporter was creating an interstitial chasm in the fabric of time space. So I found myself rushing forward seemingly at a great rate of speed, but also sometimes I felt I was falling downward. Um, and sometimes I felt I wasn't moving at all. Really what was happening was rather than, than the teleporter digitizing us, you know, disintegrating us and then reintegrating us at the destination, it was wrapping the universe around us and we were passing through to a new location on, on the Earth. When I would look to the side of the tunnel, I would see bands of light that were moving at an incredible rate of speed. And in them, I could see a, a multiplicity of, of events going on in other on other timelines, rapidly rushing past. And then after several seconds of that, we would see a light at the end of the tunnel. It would approach very quickly as if it was going to hit us. And we would find footfall uh, in New Mexico. We, we learned, um, beginning in the fall of 1970, that we could spend the entire day in New Mexico and dusk would fall there. And then we would be taken to the Sandia National Labs where the teleport was. And we would jump back to New Jersey and find that it was broad daylight. So they were literally using time travel to conceal the time travel program that was then emerging. The other device we were working with extensively uh, was not a teleport, it was a device called a chronovisor. A chronovisor is um, an electro-optical device that propagates a hologram that is so dense that it has a lensing effect by which events that are going on non-locally in the quantum hologram, what we would call past and future events, are brought into the laboratory. And you can use this device either as a technical remote viewing device to see things that are going on in a form sort of a cubicle cinema, three-dimensional cinema as it were, or if you're standing on the stage of the device when the holograms is 
propagated, you experience in going to that past time and place. So I was part of a cadre of bright, healthy American school children um, that they introduced to teleportation. And then whenever we would arrive in New Mexico, uh, we would be bused to a small town called Lamy, New Mexico. There was an old school site there. And they would test things like our heartbeat, our blood pressure, uh, and, and other medical uh, indicators. Yeah. That is quite incredible, Frank. And uh, we've had conversations, you know, off camera, oftentimes where we talk about the credibility of an account or, you know, is someone truthful right. or not. There's absolutely nothing. I, I was just observing Bashago and, and his body language. There's absolutely nothing that indicates that this is a fabricated story. He absolutely 100% believes what he's saying is the truth. Well, now, that was the reason. That was one of the reasons that I decided to put the camera right in his face. <laughs> so, you know, when I was filming him, because I felt like, and I didn't want him to wear glasses, you know, because it would like it's reflecting. I wanted to be able to look into the eyes like you would expect to when you're having a one on one conversation with someone about a topic as crazy as this. Uh, and I felt that everybody's BS radar would be able to de de detect whether he was real or not because that was one of the first things that was important. And then the, the other aspect was that we actually went to visit those locations that he's talking about, like Lamy, New Mexico. Um, he was talking about that being a place where there was this old school. And uh, we actually drove up and we found that school. And, you know, we, we, and it, was, it had been re-renovated and turned into something else by the time we got there, but we had uh, just out of fluke, we were asking for directions to try and find it. And we ran into some bus driver, a school bus driver, and we asked about that school. And he said, yeah, he, you know, that's not a school anymore. It used to be a school back in the 60s and 70s. And they were doing some, you know, some weird stuff there, whatever as well. But, you know, but now it's just a resident, right? It was like, it was a confirmation. You know, it wasn't proof, but it was just, it was additional information that made it clear to us. And the other thing that we found out about in, in, um, Another place, uh, Madrid, uh, New Mexico, which uh, it has like um, another, there's a place there where they had this chronovisor set up and it burned down. And we, you know, Tanya Maidenford and I were like, you know, scully and moldering it through the townships and through the countryside, you know, and having phone calls with Andrew. Where is this place? Tell us where it is. And we found this place and we found it had been burned down. And in the end, we actually ran into one of the neighbors um, and the neighbors, you know, we just, we didn't tell them much about what we were doing. We just said, we're making this film. We found out that we heard there was this, you know, place next door that did some weird experiments. And then this neighbor started opening up about what really went on there. And I had the camera sort of turned on record hidden on the table. Of course, I, you know, later we got permission from them, but I got the whole thing in the film. So when you watch the film, you have that whole conversation and the end of the conversation he says that they were visited by this guy that was a child participant in experiments uh, that he said part of Project Pegasus. And guess what? His name was not Andrew Bushago. So there was another person who had come to that location to relive those memories besides Andrew. So here is a second con uh, uh, confirmation, right? And, and I think one of the other things that I think maybe you'd find funny is that we went to the location, he says, was part of these jump rooms that they had. They had these jump rooms near the airport of Los Angeles that teleported people to Mars. And it looked like uh, an elevator shaft that went into the sky and ended for some reason. So I, I looked, I tried to find that and I looked it up and I actually found it. So, you know, this is, this is a clip of me um, finding that location. It's real short. You might find it interesting. I'd gotten the address of the building. DARPA had supposedly equipped the teleportation jump rooms, recognizable by strange elevator shafts jutting out from its rooftop. But my attempt to film it from the empty parking lot adjacent to the building resulted in some unexpected company. Uh, we're just taking a little photo uh, here. So the guy came up and busted us. He was this Pinkerton security guy on it, races across this parking lot and, and, and you know, and says, look, you've got to stop, you know, I, I, and he made me unload all of my footage on him. And I, I tricked him because I told him like in my DSL cameras, the, 
one of the first frames, kind of a key frame. So the first frame fortunately had some trees in it. And I said, we were just in West Hollywood doing some shoots and I'm here with my Austrian rock star friend looking for a, a location to shoot a rock video, right? And this place looks awesome, blah, 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 right? So he said, well, you're gonna have to erase these, you know, these pictures because it's private property. Um, and, you know, I said, well, if I don't, he goes, well, if you don't, you're gonna have to wait here and we might have to take a ride in the car to visit some people. I'm like, I started getting visions of sitting in some weird boardroom with some creepy, you know, secret space program people and never re-emerging, right? So I deleted the, the everything but what you see in this in that footage right there. So it was a very interesting experience. <laughs> did did during the course of, of the filming of Packing for Mars with Bashago, did he ever get into the whys? Why did they send them back in time? And was he on missions? Uh, suppose you know, supposed to maybe observe something or even manipulate something. He said that he was um, part of a group, a, a, like he said, a cadre of bright, healthy young American schoolboys, right? And the reason that they use children is because children haven't yet formed such a concrete idea of the world as an adult. So you know, by the time you're an adult, even if you went through basic education. You'll have, you know, been, you know, brainwashed with the basic laws of physics, right? And uh, so you, you, you know, you don't believe in time travel. You don't believe in some of these paranormal events that are possible and that are being done and, and worked on behind the the wall of privacy of private corporations, right? So that's why they use kids because kids just go and they check out what they're seeing and they report what they're seeing. They don't have a screen. They don't have a filter. That was one of the reasons he said children are being used and they use children. The other reason that they were using time travel and he would describe on other parts of the film, he describes how they would, you know, they would land in New Mexico at the beginning of the summer and they would spend the whole summer in New Mexico. And at the end of the summer, they would teleport back to New Jersey later that afternoon, like from the day that they left. So none of their family members, except in the case of Andrew Bruchago, whose father was involved directly in that program, or their school friends or whatever, would catch on that they were part of this chrononaut or teleportation group of people, of kids. And the other thing that uh, Andrew talked about with respect to why they were using these technologies was because they were using, in some cases, they were using time travel to conceal the fact that time travel existed. And they were using time travel to take military secrets and stash them in other times so that they, you know, if, if there was, um, you know, a leak uh, in this particular pro project, if there, if there was some person on the inside that wanted to steal the information or there was going to be some disclosure of a certain amount of information, there was a group that would take that, that particular information and they would jump into time and, ha and hide it in another time time as well so that it would be preserved um, and then you know so if it did turn out that the information was compromised they'd have a way to get it back that that i found very interesting and and uh you know that was uh one of the things that led us to of course we found out about another guy you know unless you have some other questions about andrew i mean a andrew i'll tell you a little bit more about two of those two other technologies that uh, that Andrew talked about one is the chronovisor where we have An ernst Sinkowski, professor ernst Sinkowski, a german uh, physicist who actually was the only person alive at that time that we did, we were making the film, who had a personal conversation with the inventor of the chronovisor, and we filmed him talking about it. So I, I'd like, I, if you want, I can play you that as oh, well. Oh, absolutely. Please, please, please do. You know, because because uh, these are all, you know, because when you got to remember when you're making these films, right, you don't know if these guys are full of crap or, or real, right? So the only way to get really, like, to the bottom of it is, is and it was a boon for us to find out that Ernst Sinkowski talked to a guy who invented the chronovisor. Because when I talked to Andrew and interviewed him back, when was it, 2011 or 2010, when we started making the film, it took us five years to complete it. But at the beginning, he was one of the first people. And, you know, he talks about the chronovisor. I'd never heard about a chronovisor. I've never heard of a chronovisor, right? So, um, and here was a guy who actually spoke to the inventor. So, just we give me one it. second, one second, Frank. Quit it. My dog is snoring like crazy, and I don't want the whole <laughs> tape to be. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's let's move forward. All right. Well, let's play Ernst. Let, let play. I'll let Ernst Sinkowski um, describe the chronovisor for us. He's uh, 
I didn't put subtitles, but I think, you know, he speaks in English. I hope you can understand him with his accent, but, you know, we'll do our best here. Let's see. Uh, click over to that. Normal physics, which we are taught in the universities or in the institutes, in which is used in technical applications, is not sufficient to explain these phenomena. It comes to psychophysics and it comes to consciousness uh, research. The Colovisor, according to the reports, uh, was not only able to trace things back from the past, but he was even able to tell about things in the present and even from the future. So this is a completely dangerous thing you can do with that machine very, very yeah, bad things, I would say. What we call time is nothing real. Time is something which is psychic. And everybody lives in his own time. And it's only possibility to order things in a sequence. But really, there is no time. He told me that, and it was in the literature, that uh, they were able to, from a screen, from a video screen, to get it uh, uh, by a camera uh, documented. And this was then uh, presented to the Pope and the other Italian high brush. The Vatican seized it. Yeah, the Vatican seized it. That's what his version of the story is. And it's Go ahead. I, I want to no, I want to jump on something that he said. He said it's very, very dangerous. And yes. here's here's where this whole thing really, as I said, we talked about looking glass. We talked about this, but where it really came to um, full circle for me was in the past months, and and for Christine and I, really, as we had these experiences, we would wake up in the morning and reality had changed, right? And I believe the more expanded your consciousness is, the more. You can feel these things, even if a manipulation in, in, in time had happened, you still feel it's like a void memory. There should be something there, but it isn't there. And so often we would see, for example, cultural leaps happen overnight. We talked about this. Certain things appear on the cultural sphere that usually take decades to develop, but now they're there as a cultural fact and nobody knows how they got there. They're just certainly, they're just there uh, all of a sudden. And here's a question, and we can dive into what he said here. Do you think that um, nefarious actors, as well as good actors, we could look at both sides, are using this technology to manipulate the past in order to alter the present? You know, I think it's highly conceivable, John, that they are. And they might be doing it... Um, in a way, like with, you know, we, we'll talk about the looking glass a bit later if you want again. Uh, but the look, you know, because they might be doing it incrementally. Like it might not be something where they kind of pull some levers and they change events. Like, um, like Ernst said, like time is really, it's a matter of um, the way we arrange things collectively as a consensus. So maybe it doesn't even exist. And that's probably why they're able to hop around in time because they figured out some way to tune into those frequencies. That's what the chronovisor does. It tunes into lingering resonant frequencies left behind by collective experiences in time or in what we perceive as time. So for them to go into the past and seed certain ideas, they may not have to actually push an agenda too heavily, but they can begin to infiltrate the data stream and the information stream with a certain bias. And that bias can then, you know, that that will give the what would that the effect of that would be that that bias would be prematurely inserted into society, or artificially inserted into society, if you will, so that suddenly, you know, they may have gone back ten years and begin to start putting in, let's just say, I don't know, the idea of normalization of multiple different sexual preferences um, into the information field, so that suddenly. And 10 years later, which is, say, now, all of a sudden, that's everywhere, even though it doesn't seem like a natural progression that we would just suddenly, you know, over 
I mean, you know, through a natural tendency that groups would split off and form their own, if such a thing is possible, but, you know, their own sexual orientation communities, you know, and, and but what happens is that suddenly it's prevalent in the main data stream that we perceive as the mainstream news. So I think that that's probably, that's how I would imagine, based on what I know, how they work with time manipulation technologies, they might be able to do that. I think another thing that we might observe is the um, extreme normalization of of corruption uh, to you know in in to to a very large extent. Where in my lived experience, we would see corruption, for example, in government. But as soon as it was uncovered, there were consequences. People had to step down. There were at least pretend consequences. Now you see blatant open corruption, and I don't oftentimes with the extreme. Uh, how extreme it is. I don't see the progression. And there's many other things where I don't see the progression. But on the flip side of this, what I see is, I see we are, we're, we're having this expansion of consciousness, right? Where millions and millions and millions of people are actually really awakening. We're talking about this a lot. And this awakening is causing different actions, different decisions. And hence, it is creating all these new things, new ideas, new ways of living together, growing food, all those things. And then I feel like there's a manipulation happening, maybe through these technologies, maybe through time travel. And we wake up one morning and it seems like we had a huge setback, but it isn't explicable as to what created the setback in our current reality. You can't see the reasons why it didn't come to fruition the way it was looking to come to fruition. This is, the, this is purely intuitive uh, observation. It isn't based in facts. I can't really put my finger on it. But do you have similar experiences sometimes? Well, what the way I um, what comes to mind when I hear you talking is that it isn't it interesting how it always just seems to be the ideas that are promoted by this globalist cabal, which suddenly catch the 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 vibe of the day. You know that become the zeitgeist, right? Why is it never like other stuff, like what we've talked about, where all of a sudden a critical threshold breaks through and people say, enough, we're tired of this you know, illusion that, that combustible engines and rockets are the only form of propulsion and atomic energy plants are the only form of energy generation. We know these other technologies exist and bang, we're putting them out there. I mean, you don't see that, but what you do see <laughs> is you see all these weird, you know, twisted ideas which are fragmenting and actually you could say disintegrating society that we know the kind of society that we feel is based on the natural you know um ev evolution of humanity which we've we've often called we call it the natural organic biological timeline it's like why why do not the events that we expect to see on that timeline spontaneously appear in the mainstream dialogue why is it always these other ones that seem to be artificially manipulated dialogues which do not seem to have a foundation in natural in, in natural sciences or in just the whole idea of being a natural human being see what i'm what i'm seeing is and when you speak it clearly reminds me of our first real um confrontation with the looking glass subject where it was said that the timelines were all converging into this uh timeline of revelations of awakening and that was unstoppable and um, they said that when they were looking into these timelines, as much as they tried to see a different outcome and whether different actions would create a different outcome, it never, it always showed the same timeline, awakening is happening. But I think in their stubbornness, in their, you know, unquenchable will to alter this course, they are trying to manipulate things on every level they can. So I do think they're still manipulating things. I'm not saying it, it works, but it, it feels like we're getting these setbacks that didn't need to be there. And that's what it feels like. And what, what in terms of you said there's more on on the looking glass side, but what what in terms more in terms of time travel have you discovered during your research for your many film projects, especially packing from Mars? Well, there was another guy in our in our film that we heard about. His name was David uh, Lewis Anderson, and he was one of the pioneers um, of a you know another branch of of time travel research which he he was the call he was considered to be the founder of something called time warped field theory which you know which is um one of what he calls to be only several forms of time travel that's actually been 
developed by governments. And we have one of the rare recordings because of our friendship with um, 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 a friend of ours who, um, oh God, what's his name? <laughs> you can cut that in. Um, um, blah, blah, blah. What's his name again? I should know this. Oh, yeah. Alan Steinfeld. Okay. We have a relationship with Alan Steinfeld, and Alan Steinfeld caught one of the only um, interviews done with Anderson because, before he kind of vanished off the radar, leaving behind a very interesting website, which still posts, and I can put a couple of screenshots of that up on the screen for us to look at. But I want you to hear um, the way he describes the level of time technology that had been developed by the time, like, you know, we're talking in the 90s already. OK, so uh, it's, it's pretty shocking to hear him talk so nonchalantly about it. So let's put that clip in, too, for a second here. Welcome, David. Thanks for being a guest. Alan, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here on New Realities. This is a subject I'm very excited about and fascinated about, how we can really as it seems, according to your website and, and interviews I've heard, that we can really travel through time. I mean, you're saying it's really possible to shift the nature of the time-space uh, continuum. Absolutely, yes. There's two types of time control technology. Technology that can send information forward in time or backwards in time, and uh, technologies that can send matter forward or backwards in time. They're already uh, building commercial products that utilize different types of uh, time control technology. They're developing operational mission plans to send drones forward and backwards in time. They're looking at the opportunity, which many uh, military officials would like to see, is the opportunity to send information backwards in time on the battlefield so they can fine-tune plans with the knowledge of the results of those actions in the future. Um, wow. Just absolutely amazing. So, and it's so amazing. So yeah, yeah, it's so amazing. Oh, please finish that. Yeah, so there you there you heard him actually say, I think kind of answering your question, right? Well, you know, it's just think of the ramifications. Let's say there was a battle, right? I mean, let's say there was a battle in Iraq, right? In the Iraq war. And now you go back and you bring that all the information you've gathered post battle and let's say 50 soldiers have perished in that battle. Now you go back, you provide them with different information. It turns out different. 50 people survive. That changes and alters everything from that moment on. And hence, we see shifts in our reality because 50 people, how many interactions are they going to have over, over 15, 20 years that right. they wouldn't have had if they had passed away in that battle? So just think about that. And this is one small thing. What if you go and do way bigger things? What if you go and say like you did, you infuse someone that's going to be highly influential with just certain ideas. How is their path going to alter their outlook and their output, right, into the world? I think it's extremely dangerous. I mean, it's just, would we, would we not rather accept history as it is than try to mess with something so dangerous? I don't, what's your take on that? Well, I think that, you know, dangerous is probably the key word here. Uh, and, you know, we heard Ernst say that as well. And, and what, what, our, what we're looking at here is kind of a really this is a, a warfare that is taking place. And I guess at the very latest, once they cracked some of these technologies and began to utilize them and actually develop devices to use those things, um, it became a battle between, um, you know, egoistic or materialistic tendencies, people who, who want to, who do not believe in kind of a divine plan for the universe versus people who want to force an agenda based on materialistic or egoistic uh, ideas, like they want to have more power or they want to have, you know, the global hegemony, I guess, if it's a country, uh, you know, so they begin to, it's, it becomes um, a battle between, on the one hand, this, artificially stimulated materialistic perspective. And on the other hand, we have a, like what uh, J.J. Hurtock, who's also in Packing for Mars, talks about, uh, he calls it a bow plan for consciousness, like a building plan, a, a divine plan, that there is a plan that is that is that wants to unfold. The creator endowed us as, you know, as mini creator beings with the ability to execute that plan. And that plan is based not on something terrestrial or necessarily physical. 
that plan is based on a potential energy that's outside of dimensional and like an out extra dimensional en energy, which or a, a thought idea or like a thought, you know, tendency or part of that plan mm -hmm. that we are here to execute, which would put us toward developing into a more spiritual society, a more advanced society based on the natural things that we've been talking about. So this battle seems to be going on. And, um, you know, and it's funny because all of these things I, I was, you know, we were at the time we were making this film, we were talking a lot about this stuff. But we weren't, we weren't even going into the looking glass stuff, you know, because the looking glass in a, in a way is another example of exactly that, because you have this, these two factions, you have these J rods based on, you know, two different types of J rods. You have, malevolent j rods or let's just say egoistic j rods which are future humans which evolved out of those very same materialistically oriented egotistical narcissistical maybe beings into the future versus another fraction of j rods which are spiritually aligned which are connected to the idea that actually our consciousness has the ability to change the timelines, the change actually matter to change what really does take place. I think that's, I think something we need to keep alive at the very least that idea, you know, we have to, you know, in Germany, there's a word, a word called Einbilden, which means to, to picture it, you know, to, to kind of almost make believe in a way to make it, you know, to make a picture of it in your mind. An it's inward like, picture. An inward picture. It's like, we have to, uh, even if it's pretending, you know, I mean, even if we pretend that it's going to happen and we charge that pretense with emotion, we now know that emotions scientifically have been proven to be what creates reality. So tuning into that frequency of the, that bow plan, that, that building plan for that future, you know, utopian in the right sense world, not utopian in the sense that you can have every materialistic wish come true in a split second, um, you know, in the sense that you become, you know, a highly, highly attuned spiritual being. And that's a different kind of utopia. That's a kind of utopia where you don't necessarily even need government any longer because people have a sense of self-respect and respect for other people that they don't let things get to the point where we need to elect people to referee us because in a way government is a referee you know, but for between the bad guys, so the bad guys don't do something to the good guys or that, you know, so that there's uh, a certain law and order, uh, which a highly evolved spiritual society wouldn't even need. I couldn't agree more. And, and I want to run, you know, my theory by you here. And that is, um, our greatest life purpose is to have this expanded spiritual consciousness connection with higher consciousness. Um, and I think this is what, you know, our world, our society, this control system, this matrix cuts us off right from that. It does its best to cut us off from it. But when we expand beyond the boundaries of the 3D reality and go into higher consciousness, connect with the creator, if you want to call it in very simple terms, you kind of insulate. It's, it's you insulate consciousness from these manipulations to a certain extent. And I think what is happening is this push and pull. And I think time travel is one aspect of it where they try to change events and change developments so fewer people actually make that connection. Because I think once you have established this connection, you're beyond ma manipulation almost entirely, almost entirely. Sure, you can fall into some things sometimes, but for the most part, you have a higher way of communicating and of perceiving information. Do you think that ultimately this is the battlefield? Yeah, I, I, I would have to agree. Uh, what I see going on in the world right now, especially with the younger generations, is a literal, you know, literally manipulated disconnect between the kind of investments that we need to make, if you want to look at them as that. These are our, like, the, the thing is, I've been researching this stuff for the last more than 30 years, you could say. Actually, I started reading spiritual books when i was 12 you know so i mean i've really like it's been i've you know but i read like long books and i'm i got used to i i, I basically filled my mind with concepts that are you have to work on them you know they take a while some of the stuff that i read 
when I was a teenager, even 18, 20 years old, that really impressed me and really formed my way uh, of thinking about reality. When I got enmeshed in society again and had to get a job and, you know, and, and integrate with normal people, you kind of, you lose a little, you lose touch with that. And it, it's a constant, you have to work at pulling that back. And I only really got, got back on track again when I realized, okay, wait a minute, I'm, I noticed around me a lot of people complaining about victimhood. They go into this victim role, right? There's them out there. They're doing this to us. And what I learned from everything that I read spiritually is that there really is no them and us, that we're actually creator beings. And, you know, we aren't victims. We actually place ourselves in situations that reflect our state of consciousness. And so the young people in the world right now that are not practicing those kinds of disciplines that are used to sound bites or... Twitter bites that are less than 200 characters. They want instant gratification or, you know, some people were even proudly. I remember when I was working with marketing companies at the beginning of the 2000s that were proudly saying that young people now, they're, they're you know, reading uh, messages on their handy, watching television, listening to the radio and surfing the web at the same time because they're so intelligent. They're so, you know, but you know what? Now, in retrospect, 20 years later, no, it's not because they're more intelligent. It's just they're so superficially distracted that they've lost the ability to invest in that aspect of consciousness that is required for us to make a foundational you know to, to set a foundation for a new society that doesn't just happen on its own and that's one of the things that i always found so irritating about that um bill wood interview that was circling around that he says there's going to be this inevitable uh waking up of society well if you have a society that's based on superficiality What's going to happen to all those, you know, people that have just been, they've grown up on Twitter that have no foundation to any of these deep seated, uh, you know, heart centered, spiritually centered ideologies. They don't have any connection to them. Are they just going to suddenly wake up and have, you know, fully embrace them? I don't believe that. I think that they're going to be disoriented. And when that happens, when this, you know, they're talking about a flash, right? I mean, I think that one of the things Bill Wood talked about was this event, this cosmic event, right? And his event was this awakening of humanity. Of course, that never happened the way he described it. But the guardians of the looking glass talked about a cosmic event happening around 2030, which was more of a cosmic energy thing, which was going to affect us. Hence, the whole discussion about vaccination came into the play. And a lot of that has been filled out. I mean, and I feel a lot of it, a lot of that information into the webinar as well. And there's been more that's developed since then about the idea of that, how there's a disconnect actually on a molecular level there's a way to actually program ourselves to make it to disconnect between higher frequency ideologies and lower frequency ideologies that's where we're at right now john in society and i think this is a very very dangerous place we're at speaking of this and and the webinar uh, you mentioned it's a tale of two timelines uh you know uh, uh, the hit webinar that you produced last year and it keeps it's a gift that keeps on giving we're going to put the link in the description we encourage everyone uh, to go look at it because uh, it, it's everything we talk about, but even deeper, more precise, and more expanded. Um, I don't know how many uh, how many hundred thousand uh, or thousands of people have seen it, but I know that we get consistently messages, comments from people that just say, "Wow, this this is like a a rewatch." I keep going back to it. I keep rewatching, and I keep comparing and contrasting with the reality I see. I see here's what Frank said is going to happen, and here's kind of what's <laughs> happening so uh a lot of good stuff in there so i encourage you go in the link in the description um i think which it always leads us to this point frank where there is no outside solution outside of us there is no here's here's the technology you're going to use and that's going to fix everything it is an internal technology that we need to reactivate right consciousness and i do believe one thing i, I don't believe there's any remedy against uh, having real expanded consciousness put information into the field and getting feedback from the field. If you're ultimately on that vibrational level, nothing can interfere with it anymore because technology doesn't reach those vibrational states. Um, what, how do you see that? Yeah, this is how it works, actually. It's through resonance. Because what happens is you know, we're learning that we are frequency-based beings and that our being that our, our bodies are they resonate at certain frequencies in our brain, certain parts of our brain resonate with certain frequencies, hence the Schumann frequency 
um, you know, descriptions of how that that works in tandem with our with our consciousness. So uh, we have to um, to in order to accept or adopt ideologies that are of a higher frequency, we have to go into resonance with those ideas, which means we have to maybe familiarize ourselves with some of these ideas so that they're not strange and, and aberrant when they hit us that we're not used to it. So we go out of resonance with our own bodies. Even the idea of what's hitting us right now in the cosmos can put people out of balance because we're talking simply uh, on the matter of like electrical charge, right? Where our bodies have positive and negative charge, you know, in certain states of, of being. And when we're getting influx of this higher energy stuff coming at us, it's changing our bodies as well. And it's changing our thinking and our thinking patterns as well. We even had in one of our films, Solar Revolution, uh, Michael Persinger talk about the exact mechanism of how these energy waves change matter. And by changing matter, and he was making specific reference to the human brain and how you can, you know, on, on a nano Tesla level, you can change. These are like very, very, very low level energy pulses, but they have an effect on our brains because our our brains and our neurons are on, on a nanoscale, right? So these energies are affecting us, are very fine energies, and they can actually change matter. And he makes the example of how, you know, certain family in England, you know, they don't have the ability to use speech, but they're more like telepathic. And, uh, and he makes the example of how on, in the earth, at one particular point in its history, before language came about, there was a, an event that hit all of us. Uh, simultaneously there must have been something because language spontaneously emerged all over the planet as we now know so and what was that event well that was something that ties us into the magnetosphere and that was one of these energy influxes yeah i mean look at this uh quote here by uh from the like the j-rods when they started communicating with human beings they created something called the doctrine of convergent timeline paradox and they put together a very very interesting document which covers some of the paradoxes and how to deal with them of their re-entry into their past and what it would, you know, what it, what, what it could trigger. On the one hand, it could trigger positive stuff as well as the negative stuff. So this is one of the things that they were talking about. They were saying that the DCTP, the Doctrine of Convergent Timeline Par Paradox, suggests that the natural stargates may accommodate and support spiritual evolutionary changes and transformation for human consciousness and will additionally produce material effects on the electromagnetic environment of the sun and our planet. So they said this to us over 40 years ago, right? This is the mind-blowing stuff about, about this interaction with the J-Rods. It's like the science that supports what was in those statements didn't exist back then, or at least the common awareness and the language to express those ideas didn't exist at the time that this document was created. You know, so... Um, this is telling us that this energy influx is based on what they call stargates. And uh, stargates is one of the travel technologies, which Andrew Bushago mentioned uh, as one, one of these. He made a list of like seven different time technologies that existed. And one of them is stargates. And that is actually how it turns out that these J-Rods uh, traveled. They used the looking glass to, and they, they used stargates to connect to different times. And so this is hope for us to say that this energy influx, which is happening, has already been foreseen. And therefore, the, and again, they make reference to the rogue P45s trying to you know, prevent us from waking up and to maintain the timeline that led to their catastrophe. In fact, like here's, um, here's Dan Burish's uh, statement. He says, following the catastrophe, there's a split between those individuals who take a more spiritual path and would move forward to places such as the moon and Mars, and then onward from there to Orion, and those folks who take a more rudimentary path because it is the alleged spiritual nature of humankind, so these are the materialists from their philosophy at the time, which led us to not deal with the pressing problems of the day because we were too busy fighting our petty religious battles, and then go off to a more logical, mathematical, numer numerological philosophy. Those folks then progress slower because of the lack of ambition the lack of spiritual ambition and gradually move off the, to the reticulum area to become the J-Rods. So what he's talking about here is already there and their past, which is our present, was the foundation of these two splits in consciousness. One of them are more spiritual. And those are the people that are here to nudge us to make the realization that we can actually change 
matter by the way we interact with the cosmos through our frequency. I know that sounds kind of far out and woo-woo for a lot of people listening, but apparently this is the kind of stuff that we're catching up to with our science now. If we could only express it on a more wide scale, I think people would accept it. There are two things that come to mind here. Number one is what you just described basically is coming up in the mainstream over and over again. And it is kind of like what the Elon Musks and the Joe Rogans and many other people the uh, the, from different spectrums are saying is we have a uh, we have the problem of human emotion and if we could take that out of the equation they they say human emotion we would have a much more strategic just logical path to move forward that's why they favor AI right. that's why they favor this because it's it's a numerical solution that's just that just pulls out the most logical path forward it doesn't take into equation consciousness feeling or any of those things that make us human. Uh, and and so this is completely reflects our current reality. But there's a second thing, and that's the influx of energy that you mentioned in the beginning, and you expanded on now. And the influx of this energy is not uh, by its nature good or bad. It's an influx of energy. And you also mentioned in the beginning that these influxes, when they happen, these new solar cycles and these huge energy waves that come in, they coincide with civilizational changes, collapses of society, but there are two ways societies can collapse. Number one is people use this energy to destroy things, to destroy themselves and their civilization, or they use this energy to evolve and develop, withdraw their energy from the old system. It will still make a collapse, but it won't be, it, it won't be a violent destructive collapse. It will be a collapse of not enough energy in the system anymore because it's invested elsewhere. And I think this is what we're constantly talking about we have the ability to transmute energy the way we see fit. We can use it for good. We can use it for bad. That's up to us. The energy won't go away, so we have to use it. But how we use it is up to us. And and this is why, as we said in the beginning, it's not a question of is this good or is this bad. It's a question of how are we going to use this new evolutionary stage that we're in. Um, wh what do you think? Do you think we are, despite all the problems, oppositions, maybe even nefarious time travelers. Do you think we're reaching the critical mass still, despite everything? I don't know, John. I really can't answer that. But I, I do. What I, one thing I do believe is, or I, let's just say I feel very deeply, is that regardless of how things are moving or going, we have, a, we have our assignments, we have our jobs, we have our, our sole mission. Mine is the one that I'm on. Yours is yours. And I was telling Dieter, you know, like when you're looking at all this, um, you know, impending potential doom, maybe it just comes down to us trying to wake up and, 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 and inspire as many people as possible before that moment, whenever that moment happens. We don't know when it's going to happen. But when that moment happens, there might actually be some kind of open resistance. And so the idea of inspiring and influencing positively and consciously as many people as possible is, is for the reason that when that resistance should come, that the first people who put up that resistance aren't alone, that others say, you know what, this time I'm not just going to look the other way. I'm going to for forget it. For crying out loud, this is the line in the sand. This is where we stop it because very little of us have ever really been, we've never really experienced that kind of an organic, you know, shift in global consciousness. Unfortunately, whenever we've seen these like things like the Egypt spring and the orange revolution and Ukraine and stuff, you, when you find out in, in retrospect, you realize that these were all provoked, uh, manipulated events that were allowed to happen or were guided to happen by the cabal again, which led to the world that we're in right now. So what we're hoping for in doing all these things and all this idea of awakening people and going out there and spreading the positive vibes is so that we can reach that potential critical mass. And we have to kind of let go of any expectation. You know, like, look at this right now. This is the one I wanted to show you as well. That red uh, marker right there is showing us a, a point in this new solar cycle that we're at energy wise, right? And if you look at the previous solar cycle, you see that the, this point right here, this high energy influx is already happening very early in this, you know, in this new solar cycle. 
And, you know, we know that the intensity of the solar cycle is only going to increase. So if it's already at this point right now, imagine what it's like in the next five or six years when the sun reaches the maximum, right? We could be looking at energy spikes and weirdness, John, that, you know, we have, we've never, never experienced in all of our history. So, you know, well, hence it's there's no, going to be some change. Hence, it's no coincidence that the players that know about these things, they know about these things. The, of course, they know the 2030 people, the Great Reset people, and, and all the others, they know about it. And that's why they steer their agenda towards that timeline, because they too see, oh, here we have a huge influx of energy. If we sow the seeds, if we manipulate society, that energy is going to be used to bring about what we want. And, and we're saying we need to be aware that this energy influx is coming in and people are feeling it different ways. It also uh, accelerates, you know, if you have uh, stored trauma, unhealed trauma, it's going to accelerate how it comes out. So it's going to accelerate the negative effects on your body it has. And in turn, it's going to hopefully inspire you to heal something that needed healing. But as Frank said, when there's an influx in energy, there's, as always, two ways this plays out. Either you are in control on how you use it, and if you are not consciously deciding on how you want to use it, somebody else for sure will decide for you how you're going to use it because they're going to manipulate your mind in the way they want to. That's why it's so important that we regain that power and bring it back to us as co-creators. As Frank keeps saying, this is yet another avenue um, how we can use it, and this is it's peaking out in the next years, right? So it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Yeah, And I believe we need to invest every day in this. We need to invest every day in the positive expansion of our consciousness and how we use it very practically too. I mean, don't do shit you know to be wrong and do things you know to be right. It's not that hard really, is it? No, and yeah. another factor people need to consider, okay, is that the biology, the human biology, we've now proven that, you know, the idea that... Um, you're only endowed with so many brain cells and that, you know, if you, you know, if you do too many drugs or drink too much, you're going to lose those brain cells. Or if you sneeze too many times that at the end of your life, you're going to be like, you know, devoid of a major amount of brain cells. I mean, that used to be a very prevalent thought, but actually this isn't true. Science has proven that to be not true. We continually grow neurons through our entire life. Here's the crux though. If you do not use your brain and you do not challenge yourself to have any kind of thinking that is beyond your normal threshold, that you challenge yourself to continually evolve, to continually grow, to continually learn some new things, to be active and to participate in society in whichever way you like. Some people it's politics, some people it's art and culture, whatever it is. But if you do not do that, you begin to lose that function. Those neurons come back, but if they aren't used within a certain period of time, I think it's like within a couple of months, they begin to atrophy again. So there's, we have to realize that for us to maximize our thinking ability, our brain, our consciousness, we have this amazing gift, this brain sticking inside of our head, which is an instrument which has scalar, uh, the ability to receive and send scalar waves and other magical things like, you know, the pineal gland. And what's coming at us here, I'm going to show you this. This is, this is really cool. Okay, This is in our film, um, Solar Revolution. We talk about on the top right, you see this um, strange looking octopus like thing and, you know, sort of going into this black hole. Well, that black hole is an area called Sagittarius A and it's in the center of our galaxy. And the picture below it shows what happens if that um, plasma, this is plasma, like a plasma cloud. And we did reported in our film 10 years ago that they've been registering how this plasma event, this cloud got sucked into this black hole and the picture below shows what happens when it goes in it. There, there's a massive release of energy. And uh, recently, Ben Davidson of uh, Suspicious Observer posted a video and he put this video out there and you can see in this video that they've now, and he talks about how they've now definitively confirmed that over 26,000 years ago, this event took place. And so this yellow marker that you're seeing there is how long it takes for us to actually receive that energy pulse, right? So it, it moves from the center of our galaxy outward. And essentially, the instruments that we have now, are they're, they're measuring it now in terms of it's just happened. But what they're seeing is they're seeing into the past, of course, when they look and they register these events that took place. When they finally get the light, that event has already happened a long time ago. In this case... 26,000 years ago, and there is this long cycle. 
that just happens to coincide with the 26,000 year cycle. I mean, you've talked about cycles with some of the other guests. There's also longer cycles, you know, there's 6,000 year cycles, 12,000 year cycles. There's these cycles here and this wave, this is coming at us. There's no, and it's already hitting us. I mean, I was talking to my, again, my friend Dieter, I said, well, you know, when, and, and you know what the projected date of arrival is gonna be for the mass, the maximum influence of it? Take a guess. 2030. Exactly. In the next eight to 12 years, so starting around 2030 and probably peaking out in the mid 2020, uh, 20, 2030s, right? We're gonna have, we're gonna be in the middle of this incredible influx. So I'm saying, prepare yourselves, people, get ready, do whatever you can. Don't think of this as the end of the, the world in the bad sense, but think of it as the beginning of the new world. If we put our focus there, if we, you know, nourish those thoughts. If we give ourselves what we need to, to be able to visualize these ideas, that means we have to, you know, be open to all these possibilities. Like we've been talking about on the other episodes that we've, you know, had in the last couple of months. <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more. I think this is episode number 18 or something. Um, and, and the old saying, you know, that that's been on uh, out for a while now, there's a war on for our minds is really, that's why the, uh, you know, the, the, hiding of history that's why hiding these cycles from us because if if humanity knows there's a cycle coming which usually in oral traditions in folklore in uh, spiritual texts are always presented i mean they're presented in the bible but in all other traditions as well but when you cut people off from that knowledge you make it appear as if it's happening for the first time it's never happened before it's all unprecedented and and it's easier than to control people Versus those who know it's coming. The, the Native American, the Indian cultures here knew about these cycles, right? So their their visions are not premonitions. They're simply knowing it happened in the past. The cycle is coming again. I believe we have a unique opportunity. Number one, if we're aware of this. And number two, if we realize that it doesn't have to be a complete Armageddon every single time. It doesn't have to be that. It just so happens that usually it is that because of the ignorance, the height of ignorance we move into. And right now, the height of ignorance is to believe that we can somehow make everything better by letting AI and algorithms uh, run our lives and be complete, you know, subservient to them. That's the current idea that they're pushing on us. And it's, of course, that's a destructive, dystopian, technocratic idea. And we're, what we're saying is we have the technology within us. We're the ones. Let's use this beautiful awakening energy wave that we're getting here for good, for the organic timeline. And, and let's get together. Let's congregate. Let's co-create. Let's uh, be in community and, and finally realize how powerful we really are. I mean, everything we've ever talked about, Frank, was just about that. I mean, just realizing we're really powerful beings, not to boast our egos, I mean, all the beautiful things that we see around us, we created this together with divine inspiration. So with that, Frank, I want to uh, give you the stage kind of for our parting message today as before we prepare for conversation number 19. Uh, what is your message for our wonderful tribe today? Okay, always give me the last word to have, uh, have to be profound here. <laughs> okay, well, what I would say is... Um, you know, as we realize that everything around us is energy and that this energy is increasing and, you know, to know that we have parts of our body that are aligned and designed to utilize that energy, I think it's just a great opportunity for us to focus and meditate on and just realize, you know, what we can do as a collective species. Like here, for example, I'll just show you one more graphic, and that has to do with something called magnetite crystals. We have over 5 million crystals per gram of brain cell, right? This is, the, I mean, this has been proven. It's just real. So, our, you know, we have 100 million magnetite crystals per gram of cerebral cortex. What does that mean? Well, one of the things that, you know, we've been talking about in some of the other shows is that there's other models of reality out there. And there's other models of energy, like, for example, magnetic energy. Magnetic energy is a way, is a free, powerful 
way of generating energy, which has been pioneered by people as far as back as 100 years ago. And if we get away from this idea of the Big Bang, which is this explosive idea of reality, and we move more toward the real like um, new frontier of consciousness incorporates something called the electric universe, which is which means that the things are fractal and things align according to patterns. Right. So we have, you know, the, the whole universe is based on these amazing patterns all around us. It's we see it all the time. And that means to us, to me, that there is a higher order out there that is intended and that we as conscious human beings might be, you know, regardless of whether there's other species of humans or aliens out there, let's just look at us and realize like, it doesn't matter if they are out there. We actually are imbued and endowed with our consciousness and the ability to utilize that fractal energy and organize our society and our thinking and our culture and our, everything and all around us in our world to a higher order. And it's meant, it's predestined to happen. And the energy is coming. And if it's coming at us in the next five or six years, I would expect that this new world is going to be here in that period of time. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Frank Jacob. Before we leave, please let us know where can people find you and your work online? Well, the easiest way to reach out to me is to come to my website, frankjacob.com. And there you will find links to um, uh, webinars and or actually more of the films and things like that as well. The webinar link is probably easier if you go below down here, I think in your link below. Um, if people want to see Packing for Mars, you know, I highly recommend you want to getting into some of that. And Solar Revolution is another great film that talks specifically about the wave and consciousness and how that science behind it actually works so and i'm also on a speaking tour <laughs> right now which is cool i was in the states as you know i talked at los angeles at conscious life expo that was very successful and as soon as i got back i hit the ground running i had another uh, presentation just last week and i'm going to another one in two days and another one the week after that so those who are germans who are listening if you're in the southern german area you can go to my website, you can go to my YouTube channel, and below um, the video that talks about that German tour, there's dates and locations. And I've just been informed that there's people in northern Germany that have um, organized four speaking engage engagements, or maybe even five by the looks of it, in the month of, at the end of May. So that's another place that maybe you can come and see me in person, so I'm not always just virtual on your computer screen. Yes, and so you will know uh, Frank Jacob is not a figment of AI. He actually exists in the flesh. Uh, so Frank Jacob, thank you again for another expansive uh, and um, inspiring conversation. We appreciate it every single time. And Inspired Tribe, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for your beautiful comments and uh, for joining us in this co-creative journey that requires all of us all hands on deck we have no time to lose and everything to win here so thank you for tuning in and uh, everyone have a blessed and wonderful day we'll be back with you again very soon we're more dedicated than ever to provide authentic truthful and uncensored information and inspiration that's why we created the inspired community on the free speech platform locals there is no censorship a free flow of information and it's more personal and intimate and you can join us as a free member or a paid supporter. Please visit inspired.locals.com and join us today.